right, welcome everybody. Good morning. Did you all have a good night in the zoo last night? Um, hopefully we got everybody back. Nobody woke up in the polar bear enclosure. Um, so welcome to this session. Uh, hopefully you're all in the right room. Uh, this session is entitled, What Makes a Good Shared PowerShell Module? Uh, I'm James O'Neill. Um, I guess a few of you may have been in the session I ran yesterday. Um, and if that didn't put you off, then I'll take that as a good sign. Uh, my contact details are up there. Um, I, uh, I'm currently a, a freelance consultant um, and my uh, um, organization is called Mobula Consulting. That's my email address there. Last night at the zoo, I was talking to somebody who remembers the uh, first one of these conferences when it was called the Experts Conference and it was held in Frankfurt back in uh, 2011. And at that conference and um, the sister conference that happened in Seattle, I delivered a session called Maximize the Reuse of Your PowerShell. And um, one of the presenters here this week, Alexander, um, Jeff Hicks, one of the, uh, the people behind the American conference, and uh, a group of other people said, we really ought to take all this information and put it together as a book. And it ended up as this book called The PowerShell Deep Dives. Um, somewhere in amongst the, the small author names down here, there's, there's my name. And this session that I delivered became part of that book. And it was a set of advice on what to do to try and make sure that when you write a PowerShell, um, scripts and modules and pieces of PowerShell generally, other people are able to then pick them up, uh, pick that up and, and use that PowerShell again in the future. Um, so when you come to share it online, when you leave it for colleagues, or even when you've completely forgotten that you wrote it and you come back to it several months later. Okay. And one of the pieces of advice that I gave, and, I, and, and it bears repeating now, is when you're doing this stuff, don't kind of think of the, doing this as helping a, a complete stranger who you haven't met. Okay? Think of this as helping the future you. It's three o'clock in the morning. Something really important isn't working. You're trying to unravel it. And it's your script that you're looking at, trying to figure out what's gone, what's gone wrong and what's not working, or what, you can, what resources you can call on to help you get out of a problem. Um, uh, there'll be a couple of references before we're done to, to um, scuba diving as well. I, I uh, used to do a lot of scuba diving and I, I'm still qualified as a scuba instructor. And one of the things we teach people in a scuba emergency is look at the resources that you've got with you. What have you got that can get you out of this problem? Well, number of times you think, ah, this problem that I'm trying to solve on the network is a bit like this one that I had a little while ago that I wrote a script to do. And I can just repurpose that script. And then you spend a whole day trying to work out what, how you wrote that script. Okay, so we're trying, that's the problem that we're trying to solve. And actually we can be more generic about the bits of advice that I passed on in that chapter of that book and in that, that session, okay? Because we're really looking at a set of related goals, okay? So the, the, those things that were on the previous slide, those, um, <laughs> um, the, uh, <laughs> There was one conference I went to where, we, where people were told, do turn your, turn your mobile phones to silent. If you, if you don't turn your phone to silent, we'll make you stand on your chair and sing your national anthem. Um, I don't know why we don't give that advice anymore. I can't possibly imagine. Um, but those steps that I, I put on the previous slide, and I, I called them the 10 commandlets. Um, Though the steps that we, we produced were trying to achieve these four basic goals. And to make them easy to remember, I've made them four Re's. Now, you, you may come across something for being uh, environmentally friendly about reduce, reuse, recycle. Well, this is the same kind of idea. The first thing we want out of any, any script is 
it does what it's supposed to do. It says what it does, and it does what it says. It's got to, we've got to be able to rely on it. Okay, so does the thing work as we expect, provided that we live within the limitations that the author expected us to live within? Okay, does it even tell us what it does? You know, there's a, there's the first hurdle. Does the script say what it does and set out its expectations? Then we want to be able to use it for other things. So we want it to be reusable. So the author would have written it with one particular job in mind. But has it been written in a way that lends, the, lends itself to other use cases? Then you get the thing where you say, ah, I've got a script that works to solve a very close problem to this one. And I need to take a piece of that script and repurpose that into something else. So I want to take this script and recycle it. So now we're doing something that was completely outside what the author originally expected. But we're going to take a piece of it and include that in something else. And the final thing is, of course, it breaks. All right. Hands up anybody that's never written a, a script that broke any time. <laughs> right. They, Scripts will always have faults in. All right? There was a, um, a guy at uh, Microsoft called Brian Valentine who ran the, uh, the Windows team. Um, and he said something along the lines of, um, you don't find the last bug until the last user dies. So we need to be able to find our way around the code in order to fix it. So first off, does the script say what it does? Now, this should be obvious. So I'm just going to use an example um, of something that I came across in real life. The name should be a clue to what the function does. Okay. The other thing about that initial advice I gave was try to keep functions simple. Make them do a single task. Don't, they, they, we don't have a verb in PowerShell, do stuff with. All right? We have simple verbs to do simple tasks. Now, there are occasions when you can allow yourself a sort of exception to this. But there's what I call IP config syndrome. All right? You take a, a program like IP config, and then you keep grafting extra functionality onto it. Okay? Why something that puts up the configuration of your, of, of your network card should then be the thing that actually handles your relationship with DHCP. There's no particular reason for that. Somebody just said, oh, we'll bolt that onto there. We'll bolt that onto there. Well, come back to a PowerShell method of doing things. And really, you should have get IP configuration, refresh DHC. D it's too early in the morning. Um, refresh DHCP configuration, and all those things should be separate. So the name should be a clue. Now, I came across this in the um, contract that I was working on recently. Um, I, I was looking at this piece of script, and I came across this. So what is the job of this piece of code? I mean, first of all, the person that wrote this, there are so many things wrong here. Right. The person that wrote this didn't know about comment-based help and therefore that this should be the synopsis. But if it's called enable audio video, why, why is he talking about disabling? Okay. So now I have to go and read his code to find out what his function does. The minute you make me read the code, you've lost. Okay. Because really, it's just going to be painful. Okay. And trust me, Things get more painful the more of this guy's code I read. Um, I've got some more examples from, from this particular script because it, it was too, too good to pass by. But here, when you actually look at what, what he was trying to do, he's got one function that looks at users and says, should audio video be enabled or disabled and sets it appropriately? But he didn't write that. There's something else wrong with this help, which I'll come to on the next slide. But the, the name certainly should be a clue. And every function really should have at least one piece of comment-based help. 
which is something it doesn't need to be any longer than a tweet and I'm, I'm, I'm using tweet length as sort of description for some basic help of a synopsis of what the function does okay and one or two examples now examples are really really important Okay, if there's only if there's one thing you take away from this session, it's going to be about writing help examples. Because each help example tells your users what the script is going to do. It's like a contract. It's if you run the thing this way, it will do this. So it's not just, oh yeah, you know, here's a piece of documentation, let me lead you by the hand. Because we nobody really like, likes writing documentation. We're all far more interested in writing code. But I'm going to introduce you to a, a way of thinking of help equals spec equals test. And quick show of hands, who's using Pester at all? Okay, I'm going to try and convert some of you to using Pester. That the examples should become the starting point for Pester scripts. Now, I said there were multiple things wrong with that piece of help I showed you before. Um, this next slide might not translate very well if you're not an English, English speaking as your first language. Um, somewhere back in the 1990s, I came across a, an application and I, I kind of have made this a joke. Fettel can be any verb in English, okay? And it doesn't really mean anything. It's just do something with, and a widget can be any noun, okay? So it's do stuff with a thing. OK. And this being a good old fashioned 1990s app, you pressed F1 and you got some help. And what did the help say? It said, press this button if you want your widgets to be fettled. Fantastic. I'm none the wiser, but somebody has had to write this help. I've had to read it. And how has the, how has the sum of human knowledge moved forward? OK. Rewriting the name of the thing as a full sentence is not help. Hands up who's done it. Yeah, guilty as charged. Right, and it's no good telling me, you know, you've got to tell me what, the, what this action is going to be and why I would want to do it. All right, and that piece of script I showed you before, <laughs> that's straight out of the same script. Wonderful. He tells me he's got a balance user switch and it's got switch balance user in front of it. He doesn't tell me why my users are unbalanced. What balancing will do. All right. Instead of writing, if specified, this will redistribute users between servers or in fact, between this is for link or, and Skype for business. So it will distribute users between pools. It just says this is the balance user switch. Oh, great. I am none the wiser for that. So this is where I come back to saying something about the length of a tweet is plenty. You don't have to write pages and pages and pages and pages of this stuff. The problem with help is that nobody thinks it's important. It is seriously underrated. And it's actually vital that when you start writing a function, you put synopsis, examples, descriptions of the parameters in as early in the process as you can. Now, that doesn't mean before you've actually written any code at all, but as soon as you've got a working function, at that point, go and write a sentence that says, here is a synopsis of it. Here are some examples of how you use it, and this is what the parameters do. These basically are your contract with the user for what the thing's going to do. If you haven't got anything in there that, that describes this, when somebody says, can I use this for something? They've got to go and read the code. You lose. Okay. But writing this stuff takes time. One of the um, Americans who I, I saw talking about this was talking about putting a penny in the jar every day. Okay. Every day that you write some code, write a little bit of documentation or other help to go with it. Because the first thing that comes under pressure when, when a deadline looms is we say, 
We'll do the help later. We'll write the documentation later. This is a big cause of technical debt, and I've become quite, a, quite keen to talk about technical debt at huge length, which I'll try not to do at this point. But the idea of technical debt is we say, something's got to give. We either don't, don't provide the full functionality, we deliver it late, or we don't deliver it to the, the, the best quality. And the usual thing that gives is we actually say, we'll, we'll drop something. So we won't, write, we won't write any documentation or any help. We won't put comments in our code. We won't do this, we won't do that. And we'll put it right later. Of course, the truth is, you never get time to put it right later. What then happens is the next person comes along, and because they're, they're, you didn't do that work, they've got to do additional work. So now, instead of taking a morning to re recycle your piece of script, it takes them all day. So they're already behind. So are they going to document what they've done? No, probably not, because now they're under time pressure, and they're certainly not going to go back and write the documentation you should have written. Okay? Do not kid yourself. You will not go back and do this stuff at the end. Okay? If you don't have the discipline to actually say, I'm going to put this in as I go, then you just won't get it done. The other thing is that when we come under time pressure, the other thing that goes is testing. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll test it in production. Uh, the uh, place where I just finished the contract, we, we had a running joke of our, our test environment is so good that we've put all our users in it. Um, so if we can make it easy to get to a set of tests, then we don't lose testing when we come under time pressure. So that's the, um, the other thing. Now, help examples um, serve a number of functions. Okay? One of the things is when you write an example and you say, yeah, in order to use my, my function in this way, you have to, do, to use it like this. Sometimes they point out that you've done something that's not the, the best or the most sensible way of doing it. So you write something that says, uh, in order to do this with, with 10 objects, you need, to do it, you need to run it in a for loop. And you think, well, shouldn't I be able to just pipe the objects straight into it? Or shouldn't I be able to use a list of 10 objects? And writing the, writing the example might say, yeah, I, I didn't have time to, 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 to make that piece work properly, so you've got to do it this way, but they can point out things that you need to put right. There also is, I'm going to come to the starting point for your test script, and here's, here's a tip that is worth passing on for any piece of code that you write. You, you come up with a clever way of, of doing something. Um, have we got any photographers in the room? Yeah, anybody use Adobe Lightroom? Right, so Adobe Lightroom has got a database that underpins it. And you can access that uh, database with a, a SQLite driver. So I have written some, some code that allows me to poke around in the um, Adobe Lightroom database. So I wrote something that would let me rename files and rename them in the Adobe database. And I use this about once every couple of months, maybe further apart than that. So all I've done here is taken one line of code that I ran to say, go and, go and rename these files both on the disk and in the database. And I've pasted it in as an example in my code with, you can see here, something that's a tweet length description. Now I can actually copy that straight from the example and run that and a little bit of editing, I can change what I'm renaming. Alternatively, I come back to this after several weeks. And I think, now, how did I actually run that? Can't remember. So just that one helpful command line that, you, that, that you've come up with. And sometimes it's the, the one that says, yeah, I can use this in quite a long pipeline. So take the one where you say, ah, yeah, I'm going to take this, I'm going to pipe it to where, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to take all that and say, I've used this more than once, I'll put this clever usage in as an example, and then it's there to come back to. Okay. But 
this idea I mentioned of help equals spec equals test. I wrote a blog post about it, so it's there in, in detail, so you can, you can uh, go into it in more detail. But the idea is that these, these three things are all linked. The help must really have a synopsis and should have a description. The description's much longer. The synopsis is the, is the, the tweet length um, description of what something does. So we have a very simple specification and then the parameter descriptions and the examples show how we do that. So that's both help and specification in one. If you think about how a pester script works, the outline of a pester script is a functional specification. And we're going to see this on the next slide for those people who aren't familiar with pester yet. And then the help, because your help examples are part of your script and vice versa, when you run the test script, it shows you that your help examples still work. Because there's nothing worse than you write, a help, you write some help and you say, yes, you can use the, uh, the command like this. And you write it the way that you would enter it at the command line, so you don't explicitly specify all the parameters. And then you change something about the parameters so that now the positional parameters that worked once upon a time no longer work. So now you've got an example, you've told your users, this is how it's going to work, and it doesn't work. You, again, you've lost. They've now got to go and look in the code and figure out what's gone wrong. So when you change something, you just rerun the test script, and my help examples still work. Great. Okay. The tests should be good examples, the examples should be good tests, and the, th the, the three corners all fit together. So I was talking about photography a minute ago. End of last year, I bought a new camera. Uh, and as is the way with, with high-end cameras now, it's got built-in Wi-Fi. And uh, there's an Android app, and there's um, an iPhone app for it. And of course, there isn't a Windows app. Never mind a Windows phone app. I mean, who writes Windows phone apps anymore? You know, I, 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 I carry, still carry my Windows phone. Um, and my, my kids think, why do, you, why do you use a phone that you know, doesn't run the apps that we have on our phones? Answer is, I don't want to be on Snapchat all day long. But um, <sighs> um, That's a whole other story. Um, so I, I had a look, and somebody had already written a full Windows GUI application, and they reverse engineered the REST API for the camera. I thought, great. What I really want, though, is something where I can script stuff. So I can run, run a script, and the script can say, keep an eye on the camera, see when a new photo appears, download the preview image of the, uh, to, 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 to my PC. And of course, being me, I wrote it in PowerShell. So here is the real pester script for my camera control script. Now, one of the things about Pester is when you collapse it up like this, it actually reads like a very good plain English description of what the thing's supposed to do. Now, I keep telling people who use Pester about this it statement, try and make it read like an English sentence. So you can see it sets multiple camera settings. Uh, it handles requests for invalid file names. It can get a list of files on the camera, and so on. So each of these is a plain, simple statement of what the function does, or, or the functions do, because this, this is a whole module. So these are the things that we're actually going to test. And when I say uh, it sets multiple camera settings, well, here's my help example. And you can see it says, set camera, this, 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 and you can see it sets multiple options, so it sets the ISO value to auto and so on. Okay, ISO is called SV for sensitivity value. So I've got a contract that actually says, 
here's how I'm going to deliver the specification. And then when I write the, pest, the, 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 the bit in the middle of the pester script, you can see I'm actually going to call that example there. So there is exactly the same thing that I've got in my example text. It obviously returns a result, and I can check that the result is correct. Okay, so there should be four settings, and this one should be SV and a digit, and so on. So now I've got this complete loop. Okay, I've got a specification written in plain English. I've got something that says how I go about delivering each piece of that specification, and I've linked my specification to my tests. So I can now prove that it does what it's supposed to do, and I can prove that my examples work. If I get that process correct, I've got good help examples. I've got a script that, that I can use to, to, uh, to test everything works properly. And I've got a proper specification that I can give to somebody else. And you don't need to be a PowerShell expert. You just need to be a camera expert to look at this and go, hang on, there's something missing from there. It should do something else as well. So the, this sort of process, help equals test equals spec, is a really useful way of making sure that you actually write, write stuff that um, does what it says it does. And that brings us a lot of the way towards meeting the user's expectation for what the thing is supposed to do. Um, I was in delivering this version of this presentation at the American summit, and um, one of the one of the speakers cancelled, and so they got two of the, uh, the the better community guys to do a a session, and they described it as two grumpy old men complaining about what other people do in PowerShell, and I realised that actually that was partly what this session was. And there was somebody else who was delivering a similar session as well. And he came up with something that I've, I've stolen. He said, make your PowerShell really PowerShell-y. OK. And you think, oh, <laughs> those people who know Dr. Zeus and the cat in the hat think, oh, yeah, it's, it kind of sounds like that. But we have this expectation that one piece of PowerShell will be like other bits of PowerShell. There's a joke that we were making about the Linux community. What does a minus L switch do in Linux? Or a well, it depends on the command. Right? Well, actually, when you look at PowerShell, an awful lot of the parameters, we expect the parameters to be the same. Okay? We expect that something will be called path, for example, that you won't call it a uh, full file name or something like that. So you, you, you try to be consistent. And so there are a whole set of consistencies. Okay? Standard parameter names. thing that always drives me nuts when I see somebody else's code, and some of the code that comes out of Microsoft as well, something like copy. You can specify a whole list of file names. The, the target parameter, the thing you're actually going to work on, usually you can give a list for. And then the other parameters are how are you going to do whatever it is to the thing that you're working on? So you think, oh, great, I can, I can say, take 10 link users and uh, set them all to use the same policy. No, that command in link actually says you have to run the command 10 times separately once for each user. Well, accept multiple targets. Um, systems programmers don't understand the concept of switches in PowerShell. They, they, they assume that you're going to pass something as a Boolean. If I have to write minus thing, dollar true, just make it a switch, come on. And then what if is a critical one. I actually called that out as one of, the, one of those 10 points in the, in the original presentation that um, we expect things that make serious system changes to uh, provide what if support. If you don't provide what if support, somebody's now got to go and look at your code to figure out what it's going to do and is it going to do something harmful? And how do I test it? So what if support is really, really helpful. Command binding also gives us additional things, and we'll see some of those in a, in a future slide. 
Right, verbose and right progress for keeping users informed. Um, again, if the thing just stops for two or three minutes while it does something, we're going we're to assume that it's hung. So right, right progress for what's going on. And don't expect the user to know what's going on inside your function. Um, if you call something that, that makes a request to WMI, WMI uses SQL syntax. So the wildcard in WMI is a percent sign. How is your user supposed to know that you're using WMI internally? The user's going to expect a wildcard to be a star. And there are a whole bunch of things where sometimes you start thinking about validating stuff and processing stuff, and you realize that actually you're using this as a way to avoid work. Quick show of hands. Who's got a MasterCard credit card in here? What's the first digit of your MasterCard? number. It's always a five. Who's got a Visa card? What's the first digit of a Visa card? Always. American Express card. What's the first digit? There's a pattern here. Three. Thank you. How many websites when you go shopping online ask for your credit card number but also ask you to tell them whether it was a MasterCard, Visa card or American Express? They can infer that from the first digit. Anybody ever seen a credit card number where they print all 16 digits as one block? How many websites say you can't put a space in when you type in your credit card number? Who's the one that's got the computer that can strip spaces out just like that? But the validation says, and you get a whole number of these things. When you start looking at this kind of thing on websites, you think, yeah, my, the, the local pizza shop requires me to create a password to save my favorite choice of pizza but they require me to use a 12-character password with uppercase, lowercase, numbers. <laughs> Just why? What? I don't need a secure password. And a lot of the time, you, you, you look at what we expect users to put in, and you think sometimes that we've got the validation wrong. Now, here's an example of bad validation. Who can tell me what that function was expecting for input? Now, think, put, your, put yourself in the mindset of an end user. What was, that, what was the input supposed to be? Well done. It normally, it, uh, this, this, this can go on for a minute or two minutes. But the request was for a UNC path. Now, bonus point to the gentleman who figured out what it was. Why will this fail for some UNC paths? No oh idea. OK, that's going to take even longer. Right. Hmm? No, it's not the backslashes that are the problem. He's basically, he's basically said that you, for each backslash, you have, to have, you have to double them up. So this is saying double backslash, anything that's not a space, followed by backslash, anything that's not a space, and the end of a string. If you've got a space in the, uh, in the UNC path here, this won't work. OK? But the user's basically been told, provide me some input that matches that. Well, good luck with that. That, that kind of validation doesn't help. And sometimes you, you, look, at the, you look at the error messages you, you generate, and you see a whole bunch of indignities. Now, at the other end, going back to my photography stuff, if you've got a validate set, this is using the ISE, but in the, in the ordinary shell, you get tab completion, it will actually suggest what the inputs can be. This kind of validation really helps because it's guiding the user to put the right thing in. So validation, we, we have good and bad validation. Be very careful as well about specifying types for parameters because PowerShell will try and cast whatever you've got to the type that you've specified. And if you say something is a file and, you, and the user provides a string, when you cast a string to a file, it doesn't necessarily do what you expect. Okay, And there are a number of, of similar examples. So validation, just make sure your parameter validation is doing what you want. The other thing is, as, as far as errors are concerned, uh, the number of scripts I used to see, and, and this, this one has, has started to die off, but the number of scripts you'd see where somebody changed error action preference in the script. 
or better still, they change global error action preference so that your, your errors were then suppressed for the, for the duration of your session. Um, and I think in uh, Tobias's opening session, uh, we, we saw some stuff on error action and there was some stuff on error action in one of the, the security sessions. Um, you can use silently continued. That doesn't always work. You can do try with an empty catch. Um, and um, some things like get AD user, you, you can't, uh, there's no other way to suppress the error message. Um, what I've seen more and more recently is people using throw for errors where they, they don't really need to. Um, and catch, catching something and then immediately throwing the error is worse than just letting the error happen ordinarily. What's happened here, there's a really good module from a guy called Doug Fink called uh, Import Excel. And Import Excel, um, as a module, has got a function called Export Excel. And using this in something that I was running, it basically said, OK, I hit this message. And all I can tell you is that I threw a message here, threw an error here. Now, it doesn't actually tell me what the, what the error was or where in the script it occurred. So I'm, I'm, I'm no better off. And keeping the errors tidy, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock here because I am going to run out of time if I don't watch what I'm doing. Um, keeping the errors tidy. So just a quick thing, by the way, here I've got star error star x. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, so, um, some of you will know there's a there's a command in uh, the shell called psedit. Unfortunately, you can't pipe files into psedit. So there's an example of something that straight away isn't properly PowerShelly. So I've got my own. Uh, edit function, which will do that. And here I've got some, uh, some quick things on error handling. So this first one basically says, uh, we're going to have an error here, okay, if we pass zero into this. And if an error occurred, something bad's going to happen in the rest of the script. So we're going to call this with some different values and output the message we finished. And if I run that, you can see we got an error. We threw an ugly error message. Something bad happened, and we continued through to the end. So let's try and improve that. So we're now going to do a try and a catch. And now we're going to actually do the thing that I, I, I showed you on the previous, previous um, slide that was not a good thing to do. So. You can see we attempted to divide by zero, but we can't see where that error really occurred. But at least we've stopped the, um, uh, the command carrying on into something bad that happened. So we'll, we'll try something a bit more helpful. Um, this time we'll, we'll write to the error channel and we'll actually write what the, what the error message was. So now you can see we attempted to divide by zero and um, exactly where, the, where the, the thing was. But, ah, we've now carried on, because we didn't do a throw there and we didn't do a return, we've carried on into the section where something will go wrong if there was a previous error. So we have another try. And this time, I'm just going to put a return on the end of that one. OK. And instead of the big red error, I've made this a warning. So now that actually looks a little bit better as far as the user's concerned. And I'm just going to carry on different variations of this. Um, I've gone back to the previous one and put command binding in. OK. And now what I've said is run with silently continue. Now. The issue here is that silently continue will actually suppress the throw. And um, the um, red versus blue session that we was on yesterday afternoon 
showed that this, the, the, this can actually be used by hackers. So now we don't even see there's an error. We just carry on into the, into the region where um, we get, a, get a, um, an issue. And quite often you see this combination of command that bindings being used so that we get what if support, but somebody hasn't realized that it will actually suppress some of the error behavior. So the final thing that we can do here is go back to command that binding and we can do that, that, that same process of making sure we do a return. And I tend to output warnings rather than errors if it's something that allows the user to continue. Now you notice that we didn't get into this zone here where, all the, where everything went wrong, but we did run for all the, all the different um, parameters that we were passed. If I scroll back up here, in some of the cases, we've worked on some of the parameters, but not on others. So this first one, we stopped the script running, but now it's run on some of the input and not on the rest of it. So now I've got to figure out, can I run this again for all these values and just take the bad one out? Or do I just want to run it for the two that it didn't run on previously? So error handling is something which um, I find is consistently not very well done. But biggest need to rewrite of the lot isn't errors, isn't um, that sort of output. It's scripts where the person writing the script is obsessed with outputting stuff to the screen. I think it's how some people originally learned to code is you print your output to the screen. Therefore, we print to everything. Okay. You get told, don't use right host, don't use right host. Yet, colored output is so important to some people, so they have to use right host. Number of people who put a clear screen at the start of their, 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 their script. And I have, you know, I, I've got hundreds of lines, sometimes tens of thousands of lines in the back scroll buffer in the ISE. And if I go and, and clear your screen, how many thousand lines have I just have got rid of for you? Um, one of the things that was shown in one of, the, one of the earlier sessions was using two string. And two, two string doesn't always convert the way you want. Actually, the number of things where something just returns a string and you say, no, don't return a string. I need this as a date. Americans particularly don't understand that the rest of the world does not use least significant in the middle date formatting. We either use least significant first or least significant last. But when something's converted to a date, converted to a string, we've got to go kind of work backwards. If you really must do this, at least give a function a raw property. And it's not hard to expose properties either using hash tables or custom objects. And when you output something that might refer to a file, then you can make sure it's got the properties that let you do stuff with it like you do with other files. So that Lightroom stuff I was showing you, um, I've made sure that the properties that come back when I query the database, I also make sure there's a path and a full name property so that when I pipe that into something and pipe that into copy, in fact, I think that's on the bottom here. So when I say, go and look at what's in my pictures directory and find something where I've got that focal length, that's a database record. But actually, if I make sure it's got a path property, I can pipe it into the normal copy command. That makes reusing stuff really, really easy. As soon as, the, as soon as the person writing it says, no, everything I do is going to print stuff to the screen, it gets really hard to reuse because effectively you break the pipeline. So when you think about input, what can I receive? What, what might people want to pipe in? When you think about output, what else might I want, want to include? We're going to run out. Of, right. OK. So that pipeline awareness is, the, is really the, the key to allowing new use cases. The other thing is when you think about things that you've made constants in, your, in, your, in a function, if you shift them up into the parameter block, you can say, oh, yeah, instead of getting a week's worth of data, at some point I might want to get a month's worth of data. So I can just move days of data as a variable up into the parameter block with a default. If I then need to change it, it's really, really easy.
and just a few things on code. Because everybody says, put comments in your code, put comments in your code. We know that. We want to avoid looking at the code. There are only a couple of situations where we, do, where, where we, we, we want to look at the code. And when we do, we need good signposts. And remember what I said before about investment in documentation. So don't think it's just about writing comments. Things like write verbose, write progress, those region blocks actually give you signposts without having to write, start, write full comments. Because you can, if you say uh, write progress, doing the, doing, uh, uh, querying the server, for example, you don't have to put a comment that says, in the following bit, I'm going to go and query the server. You've, you've, you've got a pseudo comment there. And there's lots of stuff around writing stuff to make it understandable. So avoiding aliases. Um, Richard Sidway, um, who some of you will know, hates this T-shirt because it uses question mark as an alias for where. Um, so, and that's why I actually wore the, this particular T-shirt today. There isn't one formatting style. You can't impose a formatting style. But one thing that's really good is try collapsing stuff up in the ISE because that will give you a clue whether the style's any good. Don't be over, don't worry too much about consistency, but try to write stuff in a way that's easy to read rather than the stuff that's really, really clever. Okay, here's a great quote from uh, Brian Koenigan, the, the man who was responsible, I think, for the, he, he's one of the two authors of the, of the C programming language book, so he's probably responsible for the use of Hello World. Um, and he came up with something, he said that debugging is, is actually harder than writing the code in the first place. So don't write the cleverest code you can, because you won't be able to debug it. Okay? Prefer the familiar to the really clever. Sometimes that means, yeah, you don't need to do something and save, the, save uh, an intermediate result as a variable, um, and then do something with the variable. You could just combine it in one line, but it might be easier to read if you do. Um, I've got some examples here. I'm not going to go through those at the moment. Um, but write to be understood. Um, I've got something there. The, one of the things about the PowerShell script analyzer is it does do a lot of checks to make sure that you write, write things to be misunderstood. Don't take the PowerShell script analyzer as absolutely categorically the way things must be done, but it gives you some really good advice. So. Um, I've already been told I'm overrunning, so the final slide. Conclude what to look for in something that, that, that actually meets my criteria for a good module. Is it clear about what it does? Is it familiar? Does it work like the things we already know? Does it help the user or does it just validate to save you doing work? Is it smart about what it outputs or does it output objects? Is it smart about its inputs? Does it allow lists? Does it take input from the pipe? And if we have to get, the, get the, uh, the hood up and look inside, can we quickly find our way around inside it? Um, if it meets all of those, it probably meets my standards for a good module. So sorry for overrunning after the late start as well, but um, I will be around for questions. We're not gonna have, because we've overrun and we've gotta let the next speaker in, we're not gonna do questions here, but I will be around if you've, if you've got any questions that you want to ask after the session. Right, thank you for, for your attention and uh, Enjoy the rest of your conference.